you all for your, your time here. Appreciate your coming by. Um, I'm general manager for India here, Pradeep Davis. And um, it's very exciting for us to be able to introduce this new technology in India. You know, you see, when you think of robots, what do you think about? Just, just go back to uh, what you know about robots. And it's probably something like this, right? You've seen uh, big machines operating in, uh, in automotive plants. That are, you, know, you see an operator behind the cage, so you can't go in there. Or things going at lightning fast speed, like some car being manufactured, welding robots. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of connotation we have when we hear the word robot. Is that true? Yeah, in at least in terms of industrial robots, right? And we also have these terrible headlines we come across, like a man kills so and so, or in our own Manasar, we had a, I think this was in a, I forgot which factory that was, but anyway, there was a robot that uh, killed somebody pretty recently, right? We've seen this, all of us have seen this, and it worries us. And another thing, another connotation about a robot is what? Here's something that's going to take my job. Is that true? Right? If you talk to any uh, worker, is that what he would consider uh, when, he, when, he, when he hears the word robot? Yeah. So I'm very happy to here to announce something which is very different. Okay? When we talk about collaborative robots and the whole term called cobots, we just affectionately call it the name cobot, collaborative robot, which is that device that you see out there. Okay? concept of robotics now has changed with this new um, innovation, I would call it. And in fact, we're very proud to have the founder and creator of this technology with us today. So you, I know you want to hear him, so I'm going to get off very quickly. But this is what it's all about. When we talk about cobots, okay, we talk about a human being and a robot working together as a tool. Okay, so if I have an electric tr uh, drill and I can take that drill from... Uh, from one location to the other, that's what this robot is, right? If you take away that pedestal at the bottom, just take the part where you see the blue cap, it only weighs 18 kilos. Okay, we've got pictures of Esben with this on his shoulder. The reason being, we want to position this as a tool, okay? You can take it from one machine to the other and make it do some very fascinating things, okay? But the important thing is, it's collaborative. Have we displaced that, that operator there? No. The operator is now going to use this robot to do things that he does in his everyday job, to make his job easier. If he's picking up a 10 kilo payload, it may seem in 10 kilos nothing, right? But what if you have to do it 20, you know, hundreds of times a day? That's going to have a telling effect on your back. Why can't we make a robot do something like that and use the human being to do what he's very good at, and that's creativity, right? Because you cannot replace a human. Whatever you say about a robot, that it's very smart, very sophisticated, it will never replace a human. The creativity of a human is absolutely critical. Okay? So some of the things that our robots are doing today, this shows you an assembly of a seat by Lear, um, typical car seat, you know, hundreds of applications of screwing. So we just attach the screwing um, uh, machine to this and it does it. Or in that case, we don't know where the screw is, the middle one. Do we have a pointer by any chance? That's, uh, and uh, the camera actually spots where the screw is, positions the robot and it screws, you know? The other one is a machine tending out application where uh, a person doesn't have to manually pick up and load a machine. Uh, you know, these are what we would, you know, robots typically are associated with dumb, dirty, and dangerous, right? So yes, except the difference between here, the robot and the cobot that we're talking about is, you also have the human element. Bottom right corner, I think you see a human being on the left-hand side there. It's not displaced his job. The human being does what he does best. That happens to be in a, in a BMW factory. In a BMW factory, you have the inner foil of, a, of the door. You know, when the water comes in, you don't want the water to come in between the, the door and the inside. You know, otherwise you'll have flooding inside. That has to be glued. And a typical application of a robot would be, of this cobot, is to actually take the glue and put it uniformly. You do it manually, you're going to have different amounts of glue in different positions, right? Thank you. So this is a very significant uh, development. Once again, I, have, I think you're getting the idea. Human-robot collaboration. That's what a cobot is. Okay? The two work together, hand in hand, to make you more productive. But they're used in many, many more applications. Since humans and uh, robots can collaborate in many things, 
you can see it's used in neurosurgery, where a surgeon is not as skilled at keeping his hand steady, uh, where it needs to enter the brain. We've got people using it for neurosurgery. We've got people using it in bars. This is a bar. If you go to YouTube, you can check this video out. You place your order for a cocktail, and the, this, this cobot mixes the drink correctly, hands it to the bartender. Again, it's an interaction between a human and a robot, correct? So understand that we're not just talking about industrial use, because it can be used much more. In that one, you can see people, somebody has designed a machine with our robot to do physiotherapy. You know, somebody with an old person lying there with blood clots, and it's just helping him move his leg around. And it works. It's a friendly device to work with a human being. It's not going to kill him. If he wants it to stop, and Espen's going to show you how we have protective stop. If it bumps into you when you're working, it just backs off or it stops where it is. It's not going to hurt you. Okay? And that's a very innovative application on the bottom right. That's an aviary where uh, you know, honey is harvested and, and you don't want to put your hand in where all the bees are, right? So you stick the, uh, the uh, robot to do that kind of stuff. So why is this, why are we launching today, right? Why are we, this has been, Universal Robots has been, actually we've been selling in India for over two years. We've got customers already, but we've, yes, we're launching our sales operation. But with something very significant, till today, the industry did not recognize collaborative robots as a special class of robots, okay? So I won't bore you with all these different standards. There are a lot of international standards for safety. I'll just point you to one. TS-15066, okay? There was a comment made here, it's going to be completed by end of 2055, not 2015, sorry. I'm proud to announce that as of 15th of February 2015, it's what, three days ago, this has now been launched globally. What does that mean? That means that the world recognizes that a collaborative class robot is separate from an industrial robot. So though we've been in business and you know, the invention was done 10 years ago and we've been selling, we've sold over 7,000 of these, the laws for safety, et cetera, that we had to follow are the same thing that a big cast iron monster that you have of a robot, the same laws applied to us in collaborative robots, no longer the case. Okay, so we are right at the cusp where this technology has now been released, there's a standard for it. So we believe now that in India, with this new release of technology, the new standards where we can uh, abide by in, um, international standards for safety, that we have opened a brand new avenue for business and for industry in particular. Two more slides about the company and then I'm going to give way to Esben to explain more of this to you. Last year we were placed on the, uh, MIT comes out of the list of the 50 smartest companies in the globe. Okay, I'm proud to say that we were uh, ranked number 25 on this list. Take a look at who we are ranked along with, you know, Tesla Motors, we've got Uber cabs, we've got Facebook, we've got IBM, you know, stuff that we have heard about every day. And a small company like Universal Robots, not small anymore, we've just been bought for almost $300 million, by the way, um, by, by an American company who understands the value of this technology. But we're in the same league, okay? So this is thought leadership at its best, okay? We're only one of the, only two, com two robotic companies have been mentioned in this 50 and we're happy to be one of them, okay? What's the growth rate of this industry going to be like? It's absolutely stunning. It's 50.8%. We're going to go from, this is from independent studies and I've got two different studies to show you. It's going to go up to a $1 billion market, okay? $1 billion market from zero, basically, in a matter of five years, okay? And we are uniquely positioned, not just in India, but in the globe. We are, we are the pioneers, we are the leaders in this space of collaborative robotics. It's exploding. And we've got 7,000 of these robots out there okay, about our company. We have about 200 odd people, 240 I think right now. And it's a young company. No doubt it's a small company. But the technology that we have, okay, and the sweet spot okay, that, that, that's it, that it's in. So I just like to, the conclusion, and I think I just want to, to uh, I've already talked about cobots being advanced tools. Don't think of this as a robot. You know, when you go back, don't think of this as another robot that, that manufactures cars. This is a tool. It's a tool that you put on your shoulder, walk over to the machine that you wanted to operate in, right? That's number one. Number two, there was a study at BMW by MIT. And they did a study where they had robots alone, and they had a study, another line, where they had human beings alone. And guess what they found? 
Now, this is a completely in a MIT, top level study. 85% more productivity, okay? 85% more productivity when you take a human being and you put a robot together. I told you, you cannot displace human beings. We're not there to displace jobs here. Human beings are very creative. You need them. You need them for the high, high level stuff. You don't need them for the drudgery. And we have that perfect sweet spot where these cobots fit in, where, and you can see, businesses in India are going to be much more productive by using this technology. And proven, proven, OK? So without further ado, I'd like to just uh, invite our uh, CTO and founder, Mr. Espen Ustergaard. In uh, 2012, he was given the IEEE Innovation and Entrepreneurship Award, okay, a very significant uh, award. And in 2013, a Best Robotics Provider Award by the Asian uh, Manufacturing Awards uh, Group. We've actually, as a, as a company, we've got over 20 awards now, so I won't bore you with all those, but uh, uh, Espen, if I could uh, turn it over to you now. Thanks a lot for the fantastic uh, words, and thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, I'll start with a live demo of the robot. Um, but first I want to say uh, that I, I titled uh, this presentation as uh, us being part of the next industrial revolution, and I know it sounds a little crazy. And uh, so after the live demo, I'll be going through uh, some of these thoughts that are behind uh, the robot and why we actually think this is part of the next industrial revolution, why we think this is going to create value in the world in uh, completely uh, new ways. This is a talk I'll do after that, but uh, I don't know if I have a volunteer who wants to try to make a robot program. Do we have anyone here? Yeah, someone. Yeah, they do. We've got one volunteer group. in a move command and two waypoints because a motion is kind of essential to what a robot does and uh, then you can basically take the robot arm you just uh, yeah just uh, grab it here maybe and try moving it I'm standing on this because of uh, it's sliding if I don't so uh, you just make some point where you want it to be maybe here here and then the other points we can make it all down off of the other side. So like this, and then now we have two points in the program. It looks uh, like this, and when I press play, I can go to the start of the program. And then we are done. So now the robot is actually programmed, and it can uh, run like this for years. So, so this way we try to make it very simple for people to program the robot and, uh, and basically move the uh, ability to operate the robot down on the factory floor near the operators, near where the actual work is happening. So uh, I want to try more. Okay. So, yeah. If you could just repeat the demo once more. Yeah, we'll do it again too. Maybe do it once again. We'll get another one. Yeah. yeah. So, this time we'll, we'll request the lady to please come and do it this time. Yeah. If you would. <laughs> you. I just need to stand on this because otherwise it's fine. No, no, just, no, just, no, just no, move it. Oh, just, uh, I have a, here a program with two waypoints, and we can set the waypoints either by moving the robot on this screen, so this is up and down, or you can take the robot and uh, just show it where I want it to go. Yeah. Pull it somewhere. Where do you want it to be? Yeah. So the significant point here is the operator can actually train it what to do. You don't need a fancy programmer to do it. The operator needs to move it around, he moves it and sets it up. Like this. And then we're done. When we Press play, you can start the program. Go to the start. Then it runs. So that's the 
that's uh, that's the basic of it. So it's so easy to program. Of course, you can add more more, more points, and typically you want to wait for some electrical signals, this is electrical signals. So the control box provides all these electrical interfaces out of the box, so you don't need to have extra PLCs and so on for doing simple simple things. So simple motion and simple IOs is done straight out of the box, and it makes it really easy to to set up and gives it a lot of flexibility. And then on top of that, we have the very light weight of the robot, so you can actually lift it around and, and mount it different places. Mounting on, on existing machinery, you don't need a big uh, setup and a big cage around the robot. So, and maybe that's an important point too. So, for somebody, but if you want to try getting sure. hit by the robot, getting hit Why by the robot. Why is it pasting operations you demo? I mean, those are all extensions that are added to the arm, right? So that again? Screwing operations, yes. pasting of the glue and all. Yes. So, I'm sorry, we're just showing the, uh, if I get in the way, it just stopped. Okay. I can actually take it and move it out of the way. Yeah. And now but it can actually give a violation. Yeah. Said, oh. But he can reset it very quickly. Yeah. And, <coughs> but I did too much. <laughs> did too much. I did too much. Can we <laughs> pause in all these things? Yeah. Yes, you can. Actually, what we showed is very simple. You can get to much higher level programming if you want to. Okay. But we just want to show the concept of a tool, mm -hmm. right? How much training do you need to run a drill bit? Not much, right? So we can show an operator very quickly, to take it from one machine to another, how to load and unload. We can show him how to do that. Always some sophisticated programming can be done at the back for higher level stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a computer in there. There's a PLC with all kinds of. Um, Since you've displaced it so well, change the coordinates. Of the direction it's moving. Yeah, so if you move it like this, right. it will uh, change. Change the Correct. So that yes. has to be pinned on so the So it needs to be reprogrammed then. No, you, don't, you, should, you should mount it uh, better yeah. than right. just the carpet. Right. So, so we have customers who take it from machine to machine. They'll put two pins on the floor. Yeah. So when you put two pins, it, uh, it locates it, right? Mm -hmm. So then you take it to the other machine, put two more pins, right? You can't think of that with other robots to actually make it mobile. Right? What material is it? What material? Um, uh, the rope is made of uh, aluminium mostly, so it's uh, very lightweight and very strong, and say corrosion resistant. So the program from the fall. So it's it's a normal file system. So the program that was running before I made this demo, I could just load again, and then. Uh, started from here. But as you pointed out, because it's standing on a carpet, we need to, you know, just make sure it's properly fixed. Have it properly fixed. Yes. Okay. In which uh, mechanical slaves actually end up taking over the world. So it's a dystopic uh, story. You don't really want that to happen. But anyway, the, the word robot was born in that. Uh, okay. yes, that's what we know the word robot from. But well, what happened was that in during the 60s, the industry started using robotics to, to do the work, to, to, be, to, to provide value to the world, you say, to, to create uh, things. And uh, that's where we know robots from, for this kind of uh, work here, from the, mostly the automotive industry have used robots over the last 30 years. Uh, there's a, a European organization called the uh, European Robotics Platform that has looked at where robots should go in the future and what direction robot technology is taking. And as, you, as I just said, it comes basically from the automotive industry. It has moved out into other industries where we start with seeing robots being used. Next step to robot is this uh, small tool that these two guys have in their workshop. So they have a drill, they have a, saw, uh, a sewing machine, uh, and they also have a, a robot to help them do their work, do their everyday, everyday tasks and automate that. Next step for robots is um, you know, getting out of the factories, moving to hospitals and uh, also the service sector, which we'll see more robots in the future. Uh, and on the way there, we need to add mobility to the robots. And we already see mobility coming from these self-driving cars and other things that are affecting robot technology in the world. So in this context, our robot as a tool, as you see over there, fits uh, really well in, in this view of how robots is becoming more flexible, more human friendly. And you'll also see that it, it, it fits very well in the general trend that, that in this end of the spectrum we have robots all the time reacting to people and all the time being very safe and uh, probably never doing the same motion two times. Whereas down here we have the robots doing exactly the same thing every time, so it's doing the same motion over and over seven years in a row every second. And, and uh, that's the general tendency for robotics and I think we fit pretty well in this. We add flexibility to the technology. <coughs> If we look at the way the world has created its value, so the way people have been 
creating wealth over the years. We have the mechanization of agriculture, which uh, in Europe uh, happened in the 18th uh, century, where actually 90% of the workforce were, became unemployed, you can say, because uh, before this time, almost all people were occupied on getting food on the table, just going out harvesting food, but actually this freed up a huge portion of the workforce to do other things. Um, what happened was that uh, a lot of them went into factories where they actually produced a lot of the wealth in the world, the wealth that actually allows us to sit here today uh, without you know, being out on the fields trying to, to get food. Uh, and then later in the 1970s we had what we call the advanced uh, manufacturing revolution where we started using computers to produce our parts. This is where CNC machines uh, and robots started uh, coming into the picture. And then um, at least the Germans are talking a lot about this fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, which is more or less about the internet of things affecting the way we uh, manufacture our goods. Um, so if we consider what that, that makes possible, so this industry 4.0 makes it possible now to start doing mass customization, where um, at a BMW factory, uh, this is a mini, but at a BMW factory, you can actually order your car on the website, and you order exactly what seats you want and what color of the car you want. And if you go to the factory floor and you see the, the chassis coming in the right color, you'll see the forklift with the seats arriving at the right minute at the, at the, the position, and then the seats are mounted. And also the truck delivering the seats is packed with all the seats in the right order. So the whole logistic system around this is just amazing. It's, it's fantastic. It works. And that's, of course, realized by the internet applied to manufacturing. Um, what that also means is we can start considering reshoring. So that means that we can start considering producing much closer to the consumers. Because many places in the world have realized how important it is to have manufacturing. And manufacturing is basically the key driver for knowledge okay. in many parts of society. And uh, that's for that reason, it's extremely important to stimulate uh, manufacturing. And we have this uh, make in India going on in India right now. It's very important to have the products that stimulate that manufacturing can happen close to the consumers in all countries. Um, because it's been realized that you can't export knowledge, you actually need to export knowledge embedded into products. And this is what will sustain knowledge in the long term. Um, so what has happened after these uh, four industrial revolutions is the, in every factory on a stream might look like this. You have a fully automated factory where everything is done by robots. Uh, but when, what you get in reality is very often something like this where all people are working like they are machines. So all these guys here, all the women, they're actually not allowed to think very much. They're working just like they were machines. And that's some kind of waste, because there's a lot of humanness lost here. There's a waste of, of human creativity, human intelligence. If she gets an idea on, on how to do her work better, nobody really wants to hear that. So, uh, so this has kind of been lost through these four industrial revolutions. And this is where we think the next revolution will be after this where you actually start adding the, the human aspect back into the way we manufacture our goods. And I believe there's a lot of value in that uh, all over the world. Uh, so this is what we say, the next industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution. Uh, that's, that's, that's based on the knowledge or the, the, the insight that any product is, is produced from a human to a human. It's not from a machine to a machine or from a machine to a human. In the end, it's always people who know what people need and what people want. And what people want is basically to, to have special products and feel understood. And, uh, and we, can, we can put a lot of extra value into uh, our products on the factory floor by adding more of this creativity and customer understanding into the products we produce. And this will then drive a change in manufacturing culture across uh, the world. So uh, some, one of the paradigm shifts that we will see is that we go a little bit away from these endless lines of people working like robots to them being a little bit more free on how to do their work and a little bit more human friendly to this guy here who can actually by himself choose how to do his work. And then there's this guy, he's uh, at home with a microbrewery. He's actually making beer because he's very passionate about the product he's making. And there's no way he would have been making beer if he didn't have all the machines to do the dirty work for him. And then uh, you can say this guy here, he spent his whole life designing this uh, microprocessor and, and gaining knowledge there. So, so the value of this product is really all the knowledge he put into it. So I think, I mean, it's, you know, it's very high level stuff, but, but it still shows the significant change that's happening in the world right now, that there's so much uh, value in this humanness that can be harvested and that has been lost 
uh, over these uh, you know five uh, industrial revolutions, four, so, uh, four industrial revolutions we have had so far. And in the end, uh, you know, love and passion is really what people value. So this is what we need to build into the products on the factory floors. So to get a little bit uh, down from this high line, we know for a fact that all over the world there is a general tendency to shift uh, what manufacturing is and how manufacturing is done. So before the old paradigm, you could say, was that you had these huge installations where you build a factory that produces the same thing seven years in a row, and the return of investment is based on this very long-term uh, investment. And here, machines work over there, humans work over there, there's no mix. Um, there's a new paradigm coming, which is you need to think much more short-term in terms of the return of investment. The changes happen much faster, so the new products are launched much faster than they have ever been before. Uh, there's much more interaction between people and machines, so you cannot no longer have uh, you know, separated space. You need to share the space between robots and machines, or people and machines. And, and everything has to be much more flexible and re relocatable. So this is uh, the way we see things, uh, see things are going. And I have some uh, videos here to back this up. So the first video I have is a case story from a company in uh, China. Uh, they make laptops. So a laptop is not produced seven years in a row. It's uh, typically only four months. So to, to have automated assembly and manufacturing of laptops, you really need to mix robots and machines in the right way. Uh, Deep showed a, a picture of this. Um, so here, this, this is pretty much how I see the factory of the future, this video here, where you actually have the company's own staff able to use the robots as a tool. So on the factory floor, the guys working there use the robot, set up the robot, make the changes. And this is the new thing about collaborative robots. This is collaborative robots. To, to bring technology you know, on the factory floor to make it understandable for people to use and give the flexibility that this future of manufacturing needs. So I have a, a different video from actually a similar concept. This video is from the US, so we see this happening all over the world. Um, in, the U, in the US here, they, they, need, they had a need to automate. Uh, they had these uh, kind of jobs that were repetitive work. They got uh, injuries from the workers. So they, and they did not want to you know, get rid of the people. There's always this fear of robots stealing jobs, but by giving the robot as a tool to the worker, you can actually make the people working on the factory floor use it and not lose their job. And this way you keep the process knowledge locally in the factory. So you don't need to <coughs> give knowledge to, to other companies and so on. So you can work more closely with your product this way as a factory owner. Um, and here, the people in this uh, job here, they come in the morning, they drive the robot to some position where they need to do work today, and they actually set up and program the robot every morning. So this is a, a new paradigm, a new way to use the technology. And then what has happened uh, also is that we have seen a lot of new use cases of robots. So places where robots would never have been used before. So I have a number of these kind of a little bit uh, strange or crazy applications that I want to go through with you. Because when I started the company, I had not imagined this happening. Uh, this is a robot for healthcare where if you are a, a comatose patient or you are lying in bed paralyzed for a long time, you actually need um, the legs to move to avoid the thrombosis or blood, blood clogging in your legs. So here's a company that had made a product out of our robot arm, but with a add-on product, and this product is then used to, um, to avoid this thrombosis. So they can exercise patients around two hours every day, which is uh, more reliable and, and uh, a lot cheaper than having a person to do this, and maybe also less intrusive to the patients. To have to it. And another tendency we're seeing now is, um, as I said, flexibility is going to be one of the key drivers of future manufacturing. And uh, logistics is also part of this flexibility, so you need robots to be moving around. So we also see that our robots are being used for uh, putting on mobile platforms where you can actually have manufacturing going on while uh, products are being moved around in the factories. So here we have a mobile platform with a robot on top, and, and this can actually also uh, happen in, in the future industry. So this is also a future direction that we see industries moving in. 
And then we have the more futuristic projects, like this RoboSkin project, where uh, here the robot is actually moved by a feather. So by adding skin to the robot, it makes it possible to, to control the robot very lightly, and also with the hand here. So uh, this is research grade work, but it also shows some of the direction that, that the robot technology is moving in with the, our robot. <coughs> And here's uh, another new direction for robots, which is a construction site robot. So here, uh, our robot is sitting up here with a raincoat on to avoid uh, the dust uh, from the concrete. And the task here is to drill uh, holes in the concrete ceiling. So when you make ceilings like this, you need to put a lot of holes to support all the, uh, the stuff uh, hanging in the ceiling, uh, all the panels. So here, the, there's a Norwegian company that has specialized in making this kind of uh, tool for robots. So this is a machine that can actually drill holes in construction sites. And uh, this video here is set up as a competition between the, the robot and the person. And in this case, he's drinking coffee while the robot is doing his work, and he's doing the hard work of drilling the holes. And uh, other applications we're seeing with our robots is um, robots for TV studios. So we see that uh, a lot of TV studios they actually want to do special camera effects and so on more than they, what they can do with a pen tilt uh, robot. So we actually see in many countries also our robots being used for uh, TV studio robots. So you can do this kind of effect where the camera is tracking the guy while he's walking around. So you can do, do a little bit more dynamic pictures. And uh, also, as Pradeep mentioned, here's a video of this robot kitchen. So this is uh, for the guy who has everything. Uh, then he can also have a robot kitchen. So when he leaves work, he can text the robot to start cooking. And then when he's home, the food is ready. Uh, but uh, And uh, as Pradeep mentioned, these uh, motions are actually recorded from famous celebrity chefs. So you can actually choose which celebrity chef you want to cook your food. And then, as was also mentioned, here's one more uh, example of this human-robot collaboration. So uh, in this video here, the robot is working in a bar. And the bar is made uh, visually spectacular to attract the, audi the audience. And the interaction is done with the bartender. But then the bartender sends the robot up and gets the drinks, the ingredients needed for the various drinks, and goes down and serves the drinks to the bartender. Um, so, so that's also. Uh, something new for robots and something that we had not seen coming when we started the company. And the last video I have here uh, is, um, is from a company in California that has completely turned the whole supply chain upside down. So, um, you know, when you go into a shoe shop, you want a pair of shoes. Maybe they don't have your size. These guys have solved it. So this is actually in-shop manufacturing, where the, the shoe is produced in the shop. So they always have your size, and it's actually made especially for you. So this is really a one-off product, where first your feet are scanned, and then the flip-flop is created based on the scan. And then, uh, interestingly enough, we were also chosen to be the first non-human ever to open a stock uh, at NASDAQ. So here our robot is opening um, a new stock at uh, NASDAQ called RoboStocks. And uh, we were honored to be the first uh, human, non-human ever to ring this bell. And uh, you could also say this is maybe the last thing you want to automate, because this is actually automating the honor of ringing a bell, which doesn't make sense. But still, kind of fun. So, so just to summarize a little bit, so I think we actually made uh, we made a new kind of robot. It looks a lot like the existing robots, but it is something new. There's something about mixing people and robots that, that has novelty to it. And uh, it has opened up people's eyes to what a robot can be and what a robot can do quite a lot all over the world. Uh, 
And um, I think we are really part of the future, so the future is coming now. We are very happy to be able to open up the offices here. <coughs> so it's time for questions, so we can uh, do that. Yeah, we'll open it up to questions and uh, just a couple of things I forgot to mention earlier was um, the way we go to market is through our distribution channel and I, I see two of our distributors here, I just request them to stand up. Um, uh, MCON Systems, Mr. Naresh Kanthur and uh, Presimac, Mr. Mr. Kate Kerr. And so uh, I don't see anybody else but we have actually five distributors in India right now and uh, uh, that's how we go to market and these are all very experienced uh, automation uh, consultants that we have. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, one of the things we do to make business easy is, you know the software that he showed you on the tablet, it's available free of cost to anybody. You want to go and see it, come to our website, just go to the download link, download it. Uh, you can actually do a complete simulation, you know, and even if you don't have the robot, you can play with it, you know, and uh, uh, so we make it very easy for you to do business. So something that uh, I thought I'd keep you advised. and. If a university student wants to spend time on it, you know, you, you yourselves, you can. Okay. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any uh, questions. Yeah. What is the price of the robot? How is it priced? Okay. Um, so the pricing of the robot. See, we have different um, uh, pay, uh, payloads, right? So we have a three kg payload. There's a five kg and a ten kg. Obviously, the pricing is is different. Um, plus, what we sell is just that. What you see there, the arm. The arm by itself doesn't do anything, correct? You have to have uh, a gripper, sometimes you have a little bit of engineering, like sometimes there's a conveyor belt to be put in, you know. So each system is very different, but if you just want a rough ballpark, I'd say put around 20 lakhs in your, in your mind, you know, you need to put some kind of investment of that. It can go anywhere from there to higher depending on how complex you need a vision camera, do I need, uh, uh, you know, various other factors are there. Percentage reduction in, in what? By using this robot. Like oh. Mention the amount of brochures where it helps you save costs. Correct, correct. Okay, so see, you have to understand that uh, safety is just one thing. You know, we talk about the safety uh, equipment that you don't need with this thing. But the other things are the lightweight and the fact that it's flexible, right? So when you look at an industrial robot, you can't think of using it in multiple applications. You, it's planted in one location and that's it, correct? So when you take this, the cost cuts amortized in multiple applications, you see? So it's a, it's a very different, it's not like we're trying to compete with the industrial robots, it's a whole different paradigm. So the markets that we've opened up, like you've seen, you could never imagine industrial robots doing a bartending application, for example, right? So it's a whole parallel market that's opened up because of this twist of human-robot collaboration. That, that's what we are here to emphasize. You know, it's not like we're going into the same market that industrial robots. It's a whole different market. Yeah. Where are you producing the uh, hardware for this? We were, we were talking about making India. Okay. So do you plan to bring the manufacturing? Okay, so yeah, I mean, we are just starting up in India, right? The sales office has just started and we expect the uptake to be pretty good. So obviously, as the numbers pick up, it won't make sense to uh, import everything and make it here. How that goes is left to be seen, right? So as of now, uh, you want to talk a little bit about manufacturing? Yeah, so right now, right now, I mean, we, we have grown a lot. We knew we had a product that could actually grow very fast. So the way we set up the company was we had a pretty small core company. Then we have a lot of uh, suppliers for all the parts. We do assembly and testing uh, in Denmark. And then we ship it to all over the world. That's how we do it right now. And the parts are supplied from wherever it makes most sense. So that's just where, where it makes sense to get it from. Uh, you mentioned uh, a very interesting example of Yushu, and uh, I can completely agree with that. You know, it's doing brilliant work. But uh, in the age where 3D printing is becoming extremely uh, rewarding, uh, and uh, to the extent that in say a hundred years time we're talking about uh, underwater cities and 3D printed cars and everything, uh, how do you see a technology that is uh, still conventionally very robotic? Uh, you know, keeping up with the 3D printing technology that we have and cars being produced uh, using 3D uh, printing technology. Uh, where, where do you see this going in, say, the next uh, 50 to 70 years or something like that? I, I think the two technologies support each other very well. So 3D printing pr makes stuff, the robot does motions, movement. 
So you can add 3D technology on the robot or they can supplement each other. Both of them enable manufacturing closer to the consumers. And this is basically where I see the thing going. I see, I, I see the world having more and more localized manufacturing and more and more specialized products and smaller and smaller product <coughs> matches, maybe one-off products in the end. And that's the general tendency I see. And I, th I think both these collaborative robots and 3D printers add to this, uh, this direction. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, uh, actually you showed us a small video of the guys uh, you know, putting nails in the roof. Uh, is it possible that it measures the distance on its own using some laser or uh, camera technology or something like that? Yes, so it's possible to connect all sorts of things to the robot. Um, I didn't mention, but it's also, also something we are a little interested in. We are thinking a little bit about the robot as a platform. So I think we'll see a lot uh, of companies in India that provide some kind of extra capability on top of the robot and start selling to each other these capabilities. Uh, this we've seen in many parts of the world. So, so the robot is a little bit in this sense like an iPhone or something. And we'll, we'll have this website of contacts between partners all over the world that can sell like this raincoat you saw here. Somebody makes a raincoat. Somebody makes a piece of software for joysticking the robot inside a, dangerous, a chemically dangerous environment. We see all these things happening now. And, uh, so, so that's just adding to the use of, of this kind of robot. Uh, have you had any defensively uh, implementation of this product? <coughs> Defensive. Defense. 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 Implementation. Yeah. Uh, implementation in the defense uh, sector. We, we've had we've had people talking to us. Uh, it's in the process. You know, mine handling, for example, yeah. nuclear material handling. Yes, we are we're in discussion with with certain uh, new uh, defense organizations uh, for is that. This globally or uh, domestic? Yeah, uh, domestically, I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. Huh? Uh, one last question from my side again. Uh, you spoke about uh, ROI in the long term uh, compared to uh, the, uh, the big fixed installations that we have robots in, in, in the manufacturing world. Uh, this is a limited application device as I see it because uh, you know it's for smaller payloads and very very uh, limited space. Uh, so when say for example you talk about car companies, uh, these guys have uh, economics of scale going pretty for them. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and, and then you talk about customization of cars, for example, uh, that is very helpful with such a device. Uh, how is ROI dependent on that? Because uh, there is a very small segment of population which will go for something like customization. Uh, so, how, how do you justify ROI with that? Okay. I'll take that on. I can only talk uh, globally. Yeah, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a local example. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we see the flexibility is what gives it the ROI. So, so by using a robot, uh, you can actually move it to new applications. I, I don't agree that it's very limited in its use. We, it's the same size as a human arm, kind of the same lifting capacity. So when it, whenever there's a person doing something with an arm in manufacturing, you can uh, most likely somehow get the robot to do same kind of job. So there's a very unique universal uh, uh, you know, uh, field, or field or trait on the robot or attribute on the robot. So, uh, and we see that even though we actually intended these robots for being used on small companies, we see that almost all uh, auto, uh, automotive manufacturers in the world have started adopting the robots. And if you visit these uh, automotive factories, you'll see that the body shop is fully automated with traditional robots. The paint shop is just dipping cars and paint and putting them on a the shelf. And then the assembly hall is all manual labor. And uh, to, to automate the assembly hall, this is exactly what is needed, uh, even in these big companies. So they're all uh, looking at these robots to, to do that. So th this is an example. This is a BMW factory, which, as you said, is fully automated. But they have now found specific applications where actually you need a human and uh, a robot to interact. It actually works better for this application, for example, uh, where you need pressure. You need pressure for the glue, for the, for the inside of the door to stick. It was actually causing corporal tunnel syndrome to a lot of the operators. It was an ideal application where the two work together. So yes, uh, we hear you about the uh, customization, but uh, you know, even the large, uh, even the assembly lines, the traditional car companies are using, are finding pockets where they can use this. You know, because the, the labor loves this. It makes their job easier. They don't lose their jobs, right? And uh, we actually find that the human creativity is actually helping these people. But also intangible uh, gains because you don't get uh, uh, sort of medical deformities. Medical yeah. deformities and other, uh, correct, exactly right. How many cohorts have been installed on a similar 
assembly. Okay, you know the video he showed you on the um, uh, laptop assembly? We got an order for 60 robots just off the bat for that one line. That's to give you an example. So typically you can have hundreds, you know, but most people what they do is they, they do a test application like this, one or two, and then they um, so each assembly line is different, but I'm saying the, the volumes can be pretty substantial uh, once, you, uh, once you cross that basic testing threshold. So does, it, does it affect the uh, bottom lines of the start of the Bottom lines? Uh, not, I don't think we are at a volume yet where we affect the car manufacturers' bottom lines, but a lot of the small companies we're in, they are much quicker at adopting this new technology. They have significantly affected the bottom line, and, and an interesting thing is that the more robots they buy, the more people they hire. So it's because they become more competitive, they get high quality products. And actually it turns out that instead of getting people out, they actually get people in when they get more robots. So we have small companies with uh, five people only that have three robots. And we have small companies with 100 people with 50 robots. And, and they all hire more people when they get these robots. And in the end, it's because they get more out of the machines. So they get a better utilization of the existing equipment. They get a more consistent product flow. They get more consistent product quality. And all this adds to their value. So it's not so much the labor they save. It's actually the value they gain from using the robots. And from an Indian perspective, it's not just the tier one automotives that we're seeing take this technology. I mean, obviously, they are our larger customers today. However, where we're seeing it go down is to the tier two suppliers, the guys who make the, let's say, the petrol tank, you know, or the, uh, the, the lamp, the headlamp, you know, machining of that little component. They also need automation. They have as difficult a time to keep labor there. And uh, the other thing I didn't really mention is the pace setting capability. You know, when you, when you go to this Olympics and you see these robots happening, and there's one guy keeping track, keeping pace, right? And everybody falls in line with that, and therefore the boat goes faster. We find the pace setting capability of robots Wherein, if, if a robot and a human being are working together, let's say I'm, I'm the human being here and my in tray is being filled up by a robot. I mean, the in tray can only fill up so much before my boss is on my case, right? So there's a certain pace setting capability that reduces the idle time of the entire line. And that's very beneficial for the smaller manufacturers where, um, you know, we have the very low paid, uh, the, uh, the uh, workers, you know, and to keep them from taking too long tea breaks or whatever, you know, this this helps in the in the pace setting. The productivity does go up. Uh, uh, are you are you already in talks with uh, some of the manufacturers in India, or uh, which are the clients that you already have signed up with? Oh, uh, we have lots of clients already in India. See, the thing is, even though we're opening a sales office as of uh, October, we've been selling robots into India for the last three years, right? So. And these, these are people who have seen our robots in action <coughs> in the Hanover Fair and Baba Kalyani, an example, just came there to uh, uh, this thing. He saw the robot and he placed an order, right? So these, these are people. So we've got customers around India. It's for the first time we're doing a, a serious launch on Indian soil, you know? So that's the only difference. We've been selling for a while. And, and which industry contributes to the massive extent? Today oh, it's automotive. Today it's automotive, but uh, we also see that uh, auto and auto components, I'm sorry, yeah, these two. Yeah. And, and you, you foresee uh, penetrating into other industries? Yes, yes. We, feel, we see uh, food. Food will be a big one, packaging. Um, we also see uh, electronics. You know, we have our smallest robot is like a three kilogram payload. And uh, we, we see some, some opportunities there. Uh, of course, these one-off applications, you see a lot of these small ones that, uh, that do keep popping up. Somebody was looking to take rasgullas and uh, pop, uh, put it in two in a, in a dabba for lunch. You know, so we're seeing a lot of indigenous applications coming in where they're not able to keep. You may think that's a dumb application, right? But getting labor to do that kind of work over and over again is proving to be a challenge, and they're coming to us for solutions there. Yeah. What is the neurosurgery? Uh -huh. So uh, has it already performed? Uh, neurosurgeon. Okay. If it has. I'll, he's the expert. So it is. I mean, it, it's not doing the actual surgery. There are two, we have two applications. Uh, one is holding a camera for the surgeon, and the other one is holding the, uh, some cables going inside the brain. So before there was a nurse holding the cables so that, that the tissue damage would not be so bad. So when the doctor is doing things, that the, the, the cable will go into the brain at the same area. So now it's the robot doing this adjustment. Of the cable. So has it already been a part of such an operation? Uh, as far as I know, yes.
but it's not our main business, I would say. It's definitely a niche uh, for us, so it's not something we would uh, go out and sell. This application that you see, where the robot is controlling the screen, right, it looks kind of fun. The BMW is using it in their showroom in Munich. Munich is the second largest visited uh, factory, uh, I mean, uh, tourist attraction in uh, Germany. So when you go up to see a, a BMW, this is Espen's idea, and you know, an i8, and I want to see the engine part. You really can't go see the engine, right? The camera is then positioned by a device like this, and the screen is then positioned. You can have different angles of the screen, and you can have the, the camera facing the audience, which so the audience feels, feels part of the event. You know, this is entertainment industry, but I can see uses here in India, you know, where IPL, we're talking Bollywood, these, these are good, uh, interesting applications that people have devised, you know, using our robots. The point is, there's a lot of new, interesting opportunities out there, and we don't really know where this can go. Uh, we're just surprised about the number of new applications that people think of, and that's, yeah. you know, it's, for me, it's very interesting to go to YouTube and see where the, our robots are used, because I find <coughs> something new every time, uh, something like this. But uh, the robots were intended for industry use. That's where we are target, but we see a lot of potential outside industry too. You said neuroscience are using this technique all, uh, all over the world. No, we, not, we didn't say all over the world. We've, we've had one application. One particular, I think was it a company or a... No, we make the arm, so that's what we do. Is any particular hospital in the world using this technique? Yeah, I think this is the, which one was this? Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure we're allowed to say. Oh, okay. But uh, the point, we, well, our point is, we make the arm. The arm stops at the hand. So whatever the hand is doing, or the robot is doing, our integrators do that all over the world. So we have partners all over the world that help, help the end customers with their applications. So that's, that's our business. We don't actually know where the arms go. So that's why we go to YouTube to find out. <laughs> and uh, we, we see a lot of applications here. So we are not involved in uh, neurosurgery, neurosurgery with our robots. It's just interesting to see it's also used there. Because it's a universal machine, it's an arm. It can do almost anything a human arm can do. And that's what it does. Yeah, I think that's an important point. We don't do the application. We, the, the, uh, why we are in business is to provide the best robotic arm. And that's what we do. Then we rely on our partners to actually provide the actual solution for that particular application. And they're just interesting applications.